I'm Mary Ann McPherson from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Welcome to the first virtual conversation in our new series, Leadership Insights, where we'll talk with IHI's experts and partners. Today, I'm speaking with my colleague, Ninion Lewis, about IHI's work in population health and equity. Welcome, Ninion, and thank you for talking with me today. Thanks, Mary Ann. It's good to be here. So over the last six years, it's hard to believe that it's been six years, we've been on this dynamic journey together through the 100 Million Healthier Lives Initiative that IHI convened, which aimed to transform how the world thinks and acts about health, well-being, and equity. You have long been a champion of population health. Through the lens of your leadership role at IHI, can you share why the 100 Million Healthier Lives Initiative was needed and how it will have a long lasting impact on communities? Mm. Great question, Marianne, thanks for asking. Um, I've had the pleasure of working on the IHI Triple Aim framework since its inception back in 2008. And we were testing in the field with over 150 organizations and entities around the world, what it means to work on population health what it means to lower per capita cost, what it means to think about the experience of the services or the care we deliver and hold all three as one aim, the triple aim. And what we were seeing through that work was very similar to what our, our conversations with other big national partners, um, what was coming up in those conversations. We were all coming to a similar realization. Um, one is that despite all of our efforts, we are not closing equity gaps, not at the population level. Um, and Moreover, there's variability from county to county and on basic population health measures like population health status or life expectancy. So at these big, big levels, we're just not moving the dial in a way that's really needed, despite all the, the work of really great, well-intentioned people who are thinking about this every day, like the folks at IHI. Additionally, we've all been working in our own silos. Um, we all feel like we're trying to bring people to our tables, either within healthcare, within public health, within housing, within education, um, when actually the right table is where, one, where we're all at with the right people and taking this time to be the right time um, with some sort of purpose that feels right, which for us, it was 100 million people living healthier lives by 2020. And to think about that at scale, right? We have put so much money into demonstration projects that are either working within one sector or working on a process measure within a community or working with a pilot population. And we're not all thinking at, but what does this all roll up to? Could we all take accountability for infant mortality? Could we all take accountability for health status? So we knew that, that it was going to take working differently. It was gonna take unprecedented collaboration and it was gonna take a focus on some sort of North Star where we're all saying we have a contribution here and this is the right table one table for us all to be there to, to really see the outcomes towards that goal. Thank you for that. As you now sort of think about those last six years um, and reflect on the work that the 100 Million Healthier Lives Initiative accomplished, on the focus on population and public health, and particularly on this notion of creating lasting capabilities and achieving sustainable and more equitable outcomes. What are the lessons or strategies that you'd recommend that we draw upon given what our communities are facing today? I love this. <laughs> I'm gonna love all these questions, Marianne, but I love this one. Some of the lessons and the strategies, strategies that came up through 100 million, one um, in spades, that partnering with those with lived experience of inequities in both the understanding the nature of the problem we're trying to solve and in the solutions to get there um, is going to lead to the most sustainable results. Um, we have built systems where um, practitioners are deciding what we should work on. Um, folks outside of the zip code are deciding what's gonna happen within a zip code in terms of community health and well-being. Um, and we have not put the people who are most affected um, by the problem as well as any solution that we put in place, having those folks, not just as advisors, but partnering in, in co-designing what that looks like to get there. Um, additionally, to do that means to also design with equity at the center, um, that equity is not a byproduct that we hope happens from working on community health. It should be the thing that we design for. And then community health is the output. 
Um, and that flip is, has been a real, um, almost like a brain transplant for those that have worked in 100 million. And then finally, I think moving from demonstration to transformation and to move beyond we're working together on a project and I hope to work with you again when this is over to be able to say, no, actually we changed the way we do business here because of the way we did this work. And we will always work together because we now have the capability to, to achieve results on anything we wanna take on because we decided to build our capability through this work together. So those three things, partnering with those with lived experience, designing with equity at the center and moving from demonstration to transformation, those are the big ones I would mention. Thank you, those are really powerful and clear. Thank you for sharing them in that way. While COVID-19 has accelerated systemic changes that were apparent before it appeared, it has certainly exposed even more in our health systems in so many ways. The fault lines that emerged in 2020 now appear as critical crossroads and as chasms in some ways in 2021. As you reflect on that, I wonder how has the pandemic impacted population health and what are some of the lessons that we might learn from the pandemic and, and these moments in time that we've been living through? Mm -hmm. It's hard not to think of all the ways that this has impacted our work and even what that new normal is going to look like, because um, I think the normal we're feeling is evolving day by day. But a few different things I think the pandemic has impacted population health. And one is shining a light on the ways in which our systems have been built to be inequ in inequitable and exacerbating existing inequities. Um, and some, for some, this might be the first time they're having these conversations. For others, they have long since been sounding the alarm that these systems are not built for everyone to have equitable access, everyone to have equitable, great services delivered. Um, and so I think. Shining that light gives us both the, the opportunity and the burden to figure out what to do about that, right? Um, additionally, we have, there's much, much more attention. We are now placing much more attention on public health and the infrastructure of public health, especially within the US um, and the ways in which we have invested or disinvested in public health infrastructure to meet these moments, but also to keep delivering for their communities in the era of COVID, not just COVID response. Um, and as we all think about the public health infrastructure, we can't help but also think about all the other sectors. Um, and it's so clear that the ways in which our sectors are set up, um, they're actually meant to be very interconnected, um, but we actually haven't been very interconnected. Um, and similarly, we exist globally. So when something happens in one country, it's gonna affect um, the rest of the world. Um, in the United States, what happens in one city or one state does have an effect. And so this, this idea that we really are operating as one system um, and the interdependence that happens in that, um, it took a major global emergency for us to really see that we are operating within a system. Um, and then finally, I think it's brought to light what well-being means for us as individuals, for the workforce, the ways we think that it all a hammer came down and we all had to stop and pause and say, what does it look like for me to li live life differently? What does it look like for me to show up and do very, very different work? And how do we, I think going forward, I think how do we meet that moment and think about well-being of our communities, of the individuals, of the workforce in a different way? How do we make sure that the agility that was needed to respond very quickly in the moment doesn't just either reinforce a broken system or actually make the system worse? How, could, how might we hold that tension of meeting the moment with agility and pausing enough to say, we have an opportunity to build these systems in a different way because of the pandemic, that we could look at that run chart and like the pandemic hit and something changed in the system because we took the moment to say, hey, we are interconnected. Well-being does matter and equities do matter. Hopefully we can get there, but, but um, that's the tension we're gonna hold as we go forward. Thank you. I, I appreciate your framing on tensions and interconnections. As you were speaking, it really struck me that those lessons that we might draw themselves are interconnected. Thank you. Even for, before the pandemic, we failed to address many of the troubling and harmful things that we already knew about health disparities and racial inequity in the United States and globally. 
what role might IHI play in reducing disproportionate burden and inequitable burden of COVID-19 and its impacts and working together to improve the health and well-being of all people worldwide? There's so many ways in which I think IHI can be helpful, can be um, a provocateur, can be um, an organization that accompanies communities and organizations on this journey. One is that the nature of the methods that we use allows us to appreciate the nature of these challenges as being complex as well as technical challenges we're facing and to take those complex adaptive challenges and bring practical methods to move through it um, while also trying to, to get to results at scale. So the quality improvement methods really puts the, the toolkit in the hands of the people who come to that table that I mentioned to be able to say this, we could crush under the weight of this complex challenge, but we have some tools and some methods and some ways of working that will allow us to, to um, take some initial steps and keep going on the journey. Additionally, IHI firmly believes that there's no quality without equity. In quality improvement, we talk about um, at times equity is unwarranted variation in the system. Um, and we've, we've addressed that before um, in the patient safety movement, unwarranted a variation in the system. How can we make sure that every patient who shows up to the hospital has the same experience, who is free from harm, live saved? The difference here is that with equity, our systems were built to have that unwarranted um, variation. They were built with systemic racist structures that, uh, that lead to that unwarranted variation. So we have to think about this differently. And IHI is really um, energized by, by being on that journey to ask ourselves the questions who isn't thriving and what would it take to change that? Bring the curiosity about the inequities and the bias towards action to say, this isn't something that's acceptable for us anymore. Um, to do that, I think IHI has always been a combination of blending the head and the heart of change. And so allowing ourselves to say, in order to take on these complex challenges, we are also going to learn and be better humans in the way that we show up to the work. We're gonna be re-inspired into why we got into this work to begin with through this work together um, and holding the head and the heart of taking all the technical tool, tools and all the ways that we lead as individuals and in our own transformation and bringing that together to see results. Um, finally, I think IHI has um, a responsibility with our megaphone to healthcare, to accompany healthcare as a sector on this journey towards population health, well-being, and equity, to understand its role, not just in the provision of healthcare delivery, um, and those services, but also our role within the community as an anchor institution, as they might call it, the ways we are a large employer, the ways that we are a large purchaser, all the different levers that we could use as healthcare in our communities to, to be on that journey towards population health. IHA has always had that role of being, of being on the journey with healthcare organizations. And so we have that trusted relationship and that's how we're gonna use it going forward. Thank you. And as, as you've been on this journey, thank you for the ways that you've brought your head and heart together as a leader in this work. Um, I'd love to ask a little bit more about people. So you've devoted more than 15 years to the pursuit of advancing population and community health, healthcare improvement, and large-scale change. As a member of IHI's management team, you've witnessed growth and change for more than a decade. How do you help to ensure continuity when leaders in government, in healthcare, and in community-based organizations may only be in positions for a limited time? Yeah, in, in so many of the, of the projects that we've worked on, there have been leadership transitions, there have been frontline staff transitions, even within a year project. So we see that all the time. And when thinking about this type of complex adaptive change, a few things you should think about when you're thinking about how people naturally move in and out of organizations, in and out of communities, they, they move sectors, um, is to think about process versus the people um, as one. So how do we think about these, the ways that we put this into our work hardwired in um, so that it isn't just the passion project of a particular leader? So how do we make sure that equity is a part of our strategic plan and is one of these strategic priorities, not a project within the strategic plan? How do we build equity and health um, and other values into organizational values? Make that a part of training, make that a part of the way that we um, hold people accountable in their roles and we 
see how they advance in the organization. All those things hardwire it in so that it becomes not just the passion project of particular leaders and then someone else comes in, but it becomes the way that we do business. Um, that type of work um, helps to, to weather those transitions of natural turnover and the continuity of sometimes people only being in positions for a couple of years. Um, additionally, is that you're constantly trying to think about how do you build leadership at all levels? That this work, um, when it's truly transformation, should be something that, that in your organization, that everyone at every level is on that journey together. Um, and so that it, it doesn't take one person leaving after a couple of years and suddenly this, this crumbles, um, that there are other people who are trained. So it's in your processes and it's in the people. Um, in the way that you raise up leaders. So that's how you kind of weather that, those natural changes that happen in organizations. Because this kind of work is the work of a career. It's the work of a generation. It's not the work of two years. It's not the work of a five-year strategic plan. So you have to think about that very, very differently. So thanks for asking that question, because I think that comes up a lot in our work. Thank you for answering that question. You've spoken about um, the ways that things have needed to change for, for all of us in this last year. You've talked about the work of a career. I'd love to ask you a question about yourself. Mm. Over the last year, how have you as a leader personally adapted? What are the things that have tested you the most and what practices have you relied upon to get yourself through this last year? Mm. So one thing that continually comes up for me in my life and career that has only been strengthened in the last year, so it's not a new thing in the last year, is constantly coming back to how am I being transformed by the work I do every day? Um, and I used to work at the front line in communities, and then I started working for IHI. And there's a change in the way that you think about how you're transformed. At IHI, we are an organization that helps people who helps people who helps people. So we are actually a bit further from the direct end result of the work that we do. And so you have to do two things. One, you have to think about how do I constantly connect myself to the ultimate mission of IHI of improving health and healthcare and the people who are the patients, individuals, and families and communities that we work with, how are they being affected in a positive way? And how do I keep myself connected to that? And that often happens by stories, by keeping up with, with the news and really trying to see where we're actually seeing results and keep myself close to that mission um, and close to when it feels comfortable and uncomfortable. And also figuring out how, you know, if, if we're an organization that helps people who helps people who helps people, how is helping people transforming me, <laughs> helping organizations? So when I see an organization or a community coalition begin to take some of the tools that we have helped um, build cap their capacity in, and they have a switch flipped of like, man, once I know this, I can't unknow it. I will never be the same. I am transformed by that. Um, and so I needed to think about how can I be transformed in the work that I do now that is a little bit further from the front line. Um, and I've been continually asking myself that, um, especially when I can't, we're not the front lines of vaccine deployment. We're not the front lines of delivering um, community services in the, in the wake of COVID-19. And so thinking about how how can I be transformed in my role at IHI every day? Um, additionally, constantly thinking about what are results? What does results mean? We can look at a run chart. Um, we can have stories. And coming back to this question, ultimately, it's whose lives got better because we're here. And that, when you ask yourself that question, results can look, uh, they can come to life in a lot of different ways. Um, and so how am I leading at IHI? I'm a senior member of, the, of IHI. And that means I have some influence in what we decide our results. So how am I going to be um, leading that and, and really pushing that question? And so I have had to think about in terms of IHI, a very unique moment in the field, how might I personally transform and allow myself to be personally transformed? And how might I help IHI think about the way that we think about results? I think those are two ways that have kind of come up in the last year, but are always part of my life. Thank you for sharing that both, you know, that that really personal question. And I've, I've seen how you show up in that way in ways that have made a lot of people's lives better, both at IHI and with our partners and where we work. So thank you. One last question for you, Nino, before we wrap up. And that is, 
Um, what are your thoughts about how professionals and organizations that are working to advance population health and equity evolve to fundamentally transform the ways that communities think and act about health, well-being, and equity? So I'm going to have one answer to this because I think it's at the core of every other answer that I would that I would give you, Marianne. So let's say you were coming from healthcare. Um, when you look at the mission on our on on healthcare organizations' websites, they say our mission is to deliver healthcare. Hopefully, we will achieve equity through that. What would it look like for healthcare to say our mission is to achieve equity, and we do that through the provision of healthcare? What would it look like for public health to say our mission is to achieve equity and, our, and we do that through the provision of public health services in our communities? What would it look, for, look like for education and housing? The way we would design the work, the way we would measure the work, the way we would show up, who shows up, what we talk about, what we decide, all of that would change. And it would force us to think about how for public health education, um, you know, housing, healthcare, that the end game is should be the same. It should be the same, which is health, well-being, and equity. And so, how might we all do that through our unique levers? Right now, we're all saying different things. That our mission is to deliver great permanent supportive housing to individuals that need it, and hopefully, we achieve equity. Let's flip that. Um, that is the way that we evolve, and that's the way I think that we will ultimately get to sustainable solutions that really do achieve health, well-being, and equity. And until we get there, um, and it is an evolution, right? You asked how, how should we evolve? Um, until we get there, I'm not sure that we're gonna see the results that we ultimately wanna see. And luckily we're on this journey. Luckily we're seeing that proof through 100 million. So um, IHI is great, it feels great to be on the journey. I feel great to be on that journey. Um, it would be a wonderful vision as that being kind of the next North Star is that if all of these different organizations and professionals were to put that as the mission and then use our levers in our unique sectors, our organizations, what we show up and do as leaders every day to, to be pushing towards that North Star. Um, what an amazing provocation that would be to evolve in that way. Yeah, an amazing provocation indeed. The, the concept that are all of our mission, all at the same table could be advancing equity. And the ways we do that are different, but that's the same mission. Mm -hmm. That's Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Mignon, thank you so much for sharing all of these insights and the lessons that you've learned from IHI's work in population health and equity with me today. I am so grateful for the critical work that you do every day to improve the health and well-being of communities across the country and around the world as you center advancing equity as your mission in work and in life as well. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne.